Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. I've tried to film this video like four times. So between camera trouble and lawns being mowed and all kinds of stuff, here we are. And I know the lighting's not great, but oh well. <laughs> Basically this video is something new that I want to start doing on my booktube channel and I'm gonna call it Sunday Rewind. Basically it's gonna be a series of videos where I discuss books that I've recently reread, books that I loved in the past and how I feel about them after rereading them lately. So I recently read one of my favorite books of all time that I want to discuss with you today. And then at the end of the video, I'm probably going to get into some new booktube goals that I have, some new thoughts that I have for my channel. So stick around for that. But for now, I want to talk about the book Cry No More by Linda Howard. This book was published in 2003 and I read it probably around 2005. I originally heard about it from my mom, which is crazy because my mom hates to read. But back in the day, she was using romance novels as a diet method. Her logic being if she was engrossed in a good story, she would forget how hungry she was. So it didn't really work, but that's neither here nor there. She told me that I absolutely had to read this book. It was her favorite book of all time. And I took that with a grain of salt originally because I knew my mom wasn't working from a gigantic pool of books in order to find the greatest book of all time. So <laughs> when I had a chance, I borrowed her copy and I went ahead and read it. Like many girls before me, I am loath to admit that my mother was correct. So Cry No More turned into one of my favorite books of all time. Now this is a romance novel, but Linda Howard writes romantic plots with action, suspense, thrills, tension. So I would really classify it as a romantic thriller. The book follows the character Mila. Now when it first opens, Mila is in Mexico with her husband, David. David is a doctor and he has generously donated a year of his time to a rural clinic in Mexico. And just before packing up and leaving the United States, Mila finds out that she's pregnant. So Mila and David actually have a child in Mexico and the first scene of the book involves the two of them and their six week old son, Justin. They're sort of discussing what they're going to do for the day and eventually David goes off to be a doctor and Mila and Justin go to the market. Now while they're at the local market, two men assault Mila and they steal Justin. Mila fights back, even gouging out one of her assailant's eyes, but they stab her in the kidney in order to get away. So that book opening takes place in 1993 and it's very brief and right after, um, right after Justin is kidnapped, we jump 10 years ahead to the book's current time, which is 2003. And we find out that Mila is in no way the woman that we first met. She's no longer a doctor's wife. Her and David are divorced. She is no longer a naive 20 something. She's become very hard and very jaded. She is not interested in anything but finding her son. So her and David divorced and David got remarried and had other children. It was an amicable decision. Mill is very happy for David, but she is unable to move on the way that he has because she's obsessed with finding her child. Everyone's telling her it's hopeless. It's been 10 years. She needs to give up. And every time somebody tells her to give up, she basically kicks them out of her life. She's not having it. She is going to find her son. 
so she's amassed a little group of people and kind of founded this nonprofit organization called Finders. And it stemmed from her speaking out about her own kidnapping experience and then gaining in popularity until she was helping other people find their kidnapped or runaway loved ones. She is leading a respectful life. However, all of her spare time is spent following leads about her son's kidnapping. Since 10 years has taken place that we haven't read about, it's kind of understood that Mila has just run into dead end after dead end. And then when we join up with her, she finally gets her first legitimate lead that starts the ball rolling. It turns into an actual puzzle piece that she just needs to fit together in order to solve the mystery. Now that first lead is that someone named Diaz will be in Mexico at a certain place at a certain time. And Mila incorrectly believes that Diaz is the man with one eye. So when Diaz catches up to her because he's heard that she's been looking for him, we learn that he's sort of this solitary mercenary type of guy. We're not really sure. In fact, Mila thinks he's an assassin. So he's got this air of danger around him. He He's very mysterious, very intimidating. Mila is initially very frightened of him. And that's kind of the portrayal of himself that he tries to put forth. He's a no-nonsense kind of guy. If somebody needs to be punished, he punishes them. If somebody needs help, he helps them. And there's something about Mila's story, or Mila in particular, that really makes Diaz willing to help her. So while he is involved already because he's trying to bust open this organ smuggling <laughs> uh business. People are being killed and their organs are being harvested and sold on the black market. He decides and tells Mila that he will help her find her son in the process. Now the book is written in third person. So for the most part, we stay with Mila, but Linda Howard does take us into the world of the person responsible for both this organ smuggling ring and the baby smuggling ring from 10 years ago. So basically this jerk has just kind of had a career change. Even though within the first quarter of the book, you kind of know who's responsible for these things, you don't know or find out everybody that's involved. There is betrayal in this book. There are twists that you don't see coming. So don't be misled by the fact that you know who the mastermind is. So Mila and Diaz together, they chase lead after lead. Things go right. Things go wrong. Theirs is the romantic story. And this book is a standalone and does have a happily ever after. But I have to say it's probably not the happily ever after that the reader is anticipating. It's probably not the happily ever after that the reader wants. It's something completely different, which is the biggest twist of the entire novel. So why did I like this book so much? <laughs> Some authors are great at world building and setting a scene. Other authors are great at character development and really making you feel like you know a character very well. Linda Howard is, in my opinion, a master of human emotion and human behavior and how one affects another. Cry No More is the epitome of that statement. So the book is 30 chapters long and I am not exaggerating when I tell you that I start crying <laughs> at the end of chapter 24, and I don't stop crying until the end of chapter 29. So I spend five chapters of this book crying, and we're not talking light rivers of tears. We're talking racking sobs, heaving sobs. It's crazy what Linda Howard can accomplish with this story and these characters. And it's that level of emotional connection 
that makes me love this book. I don't know how else to articulate what, what kind of catharsis a reader can experience by reading this book. Now, I'm not a mother, I've never had children, but obviously the main goal of this book is for Mila, the protagonist, to find her son. Her son has been kidnapped from her. I don't know of any reader ever that could not want this particular protagonist to achieve this particular goal. So we are 100% invested. I've read books before where, yes, I can empathize with the protagonist and yes, I'm on their side, but their goal, it seems unfamiliar to me or I can't necessarily imagine wanting to achieve the same goal. This book, that's not a problem. From the first 50 pages, we are emotionally involved in this story. We are emotionally involved in the protagonist's journey to her end goal and where she ends up will either evoke elation or devastation. So what's different about reading the book before and reading the book now? I honestly thought that I would be less affected this time because I knew what was coming. I knew what the end was. I knew where things were going to get bad. I knew where things were going to get good. So I figured like a movie I've seen 50 times, I wouldn't cry this time. That is not the case. In fact, I think it affected me more and on a deeper level. When I read this about 12 years ago, I was 25 and very much not an adult yet, pretending I was an adult, but not really. And I still had some rebellion in me. I still had some apathy in me. I still didn't understand what life truly had to offer. And now that I'm older, <laughs> And I'm more comfortable in my skin and I'm more comfortable in my career and with the relationships that I have with people. I know what's valuable. I can see the value in things. And I can also look back and see the frivolity in things that I used to think were important. And so my maturity level at this point has grown so much that this book was harder to read the second time around. I may not have children, but I, I mean, all of my friends have had kids. I have nieces and nephews and that wasn't the case when I was 25 years old. That wasn't, that wasn't really how life was back then. I was reckless and I'm not reckless anymore. I'm very careful with the things and the people in my life. And so to read about a character who had something so precious to her taken away and taken away in a way that has no closure. And I don't want to sound insensitive because there's nothing, nothing lighthearted about a death, um, or a loss of that nature. But on some level, there's, at least closure there. There's at least a finality. To to lose your child to kidnapping, to have this great unknown over your head for 10 years. Is he alive? Is he dead? Is he in Mexico? Is he in the United States? Is he across the Pacific or Atlantic Ocean? Where's my child? What happened to him? He would be 10 years old. Does he look like me? Did he look like my husband? Like all of these questions, <laughs> I was just, it would be torture. I, I can imagine it would be torture. So I was much more affected this time than I was last time. And to be honest with you, if I were to read this book after having children, I I would probably have to take a week off work or something. I would be a hot mess. For the most part, I would say that I remembered the book pretty accurately. There were two things that I had kind of forgotten. The first is sex. So Yes, this is a romance novel, and 
for some reason I had convinced myself that there was only one sex scene in this book. And that's not true. There's more than that. It's just that there's one sex scene that's absolutely pivotal to the story that absolutely changes things between the two characters. And that's the only scene that I remembered. But there were more prior to that. And this isn't, um, gra it's not graphic. This isn't an erotica. Um, you know, Linda Howard is not using street slang for body parts. But she's also not <laughs> writing scenes so saturated in metaphor that you're not sure if you're reading about a garden or a body. They're not really remarkable scenes in for either their graphic nature or their complete silliness. So maybe that's why I forgot them. I mean, I've read a lot of romance novels and it's not... You know, it's just kind of like part of the deal now. The sex scenes are just kind of like there. Um, so maybe that's why I forgot about them. I didn't forget about the most important one, though. And that's important to note. Um, the other thing that I forgot is I forgot who was the bad guy. I, I sort of remembered some betrayal. I sort of remembered that somebody that um, the character trusted was involved but I when I was reading it the second time and this character was introduced and came along and I learned about this character it never entered my mind that it was the bad guy until <laughs> I knew it was the bad guy and I was like oh I don't even I don't remember that at all <laughs> so hmm. here's why I support rereading books. So obviously you can reread them for the entertainment value. You liked them before, you'll like them again, and it's good to revisit those things. However, it's also good to revisit things from our past so we can see how we've grown and how we've changed. Things looked a certain way this first time, but they look differently this time because of X, Y, and Z. And that's when you learn about yourself, and that's when you learn about how far you've come or how much further you need to go. And I'm all about self-improvement and I'm all about kind of um, self-analysis, I guess you could say, in that way. So that's what I want to do with the Sunday Rewind series and that ties in to what I want to talk about when it comes to my new booktube goals. So it's been a couple of weeks, I think I've released eight or nine videos and it's always good, or I think it's always good, to sort of reevaluate and analyze. And I'm finding that BookTube, just like anything else, what I thought I wanted to do turns out is a lot different than what I believe I need to do. And admittedly, I came into BookTube thinking that it was gonna be all about how I influenced booktube, how I inspired viewers. And I, it was just, I was going to have an effect on the community. And what I'm realizing, well, yes, that's a goal. I do wanna be influential. I do want to have an effect on the booktube community. However, I cannot base my success on that because I can't control what people like or don't like, what kind of books they want to read or don't want to read. So this booktube channel is becoming less about what I can do for the community, to the community, and how I can change the community, and becoming more about what this channel can do for me or to me or how it can affect me. So I'm not perfect. There's a lot of things that I need to work on. I want to be a better reader. I want to be a better writer. I want to, you know, love myself more. I want to 
be proud of what I do with my spare time. I don't want to, you know, live a wasteful life. These are things that I'm personally trying to achieve. So going forward, that's going to be what's happening here on my channel. Not to make it all about me, but I am the only one that I can control. I'm the only person that I know for sure I can have an effect on. So that's what I'm going to do is try to have an effect on myself. And I would love for as many people out there that want to, to be involved, to draw inspiration from my channel, to inspire me in return. So if you're interested in holding me accountable for some of my goals, then you can check out what those goals are on that discussion tab. But I think that this booktube channel is a great way to hold myself accountable for some stuff as well. So leave comments, opinions, thoughts, suggestions, all that kind of stuff down in the comment section below. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up so that I know I'm doing a good job and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you very much for watching and for reading and I will see you all soon.